Penn State needed this kind of win, this kind of game against Kent State as they get ready to enter Big Ten Conference play. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Penn State defeats Kent State 56 to nothing, all around great game. However, we do need to remember that it was, in fact, Kent State. This is Locked On Nittany Lions. I'm your host, Zach Seiko, and thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Special guests on this quick post-game recap, he's Dylan Callaghan Crowley of Penn State Rivals, HappyValleyInsider.com, associate producer to the podcast here, Zane Bransfield. Guys, this was the complete game. You get that shutout that had, that Penn State had been craving for a while, the defense to make a statement. The offense continues just to be a machine. Andy Kotel, Nicky revitalizing what it means to be a Penn State offense. Drew Aller looks fantastic. All I feel like all the main wide receivers were involved to an extent, right? Amari Evans goes over, over 100 yards. Big plays from Liam Clifford. Uh, a first career touchdown from Liam Clifford and Julian Fleming getting involved as well. And it's like, where has this been? Pat, everything is trending in the right direction for Penn State going into Big Ten Conference play. But it is Kent State, so they were supposed to do this. But Dylan, how, how much stock are you putting into this victory uh, overall for Penn State, defeating up on a, probably a bottom five team in the entire country? Yeah, uh, bottom five may be generous. Uh, <laughs> you take some fans, but you got to take them a grain of salt, right? Okay. It, uh, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, watch out, this offense is, you know, one of the best in the country. You know, I think it's one of the best, top, you know, 10, They, they're 10, certain, 10, they certainly can continue to improve. Yeah, they're one of the top 10, 12, 15 offenses in the country. Okay. But I, they're, they're not the number one offense in the country. No. They're, they're not going to put up 700 yards next week against Illinois. Um, Be but, nice. But, you know, I, I think the biggest takeaway in this game is they were efficient offensively against a very bad defense. Yes. That's exactly what you wanted to see in this game. People were, I wouldn't say freaking out, but freaking out, for lack of a better word, in the first half when it was 14 nothing, with five minutes left in the first half. Yeah, it was a slow but, start. But but you look at it also, that that first drive, which results in the ball preview, at interception, uh, probably a bad play of call mm-hmm. in, in the moment, in my opinion, just because you don't, you don't need to go there on the first drive. Just get the, get the touchdown, get it get it over with. Um, that probably results in a touchdown with that interception. But that drive took four minutes off the clock there. Uh, it should have been 14 nothing at the end of the first quarter probably. But also, Kent State knew what they were up against today. They had no interest in passing the ball, especially after uh, Devin Cardman went down with a pretty brutal leg injury looked like uh, on the, right behind us. Uh, after that, they lost their second-string quarterback. They had no interest in throwing the ball. They were running the ball, ball in this game, just trying to get out of here. With they still have conference play to look yeah, forward to and with, to think about with so. as many guys healthy as possible. And even by it's, running the ball, they, they they went down like flies in this one. Um, but they were efficient offensively, defensively. You know, the tackle was poor early on. They seemed to settle down. It wasn't really much to take away. I think defensively, they, they shut down a bad offense that was with their third string quarterback for most of the game. So I mean, they did what they had to do. You take some of the positives, like spread the ball around with the receivers. Absolutely. Yep. But I'm, I'm not going to take too much away from it. Yeah, and I think to Zane, I, I want I want your input here in a second. But the reason for that slow start was because you know different defensive looks. We saw a hybrid between the four-two-five and the four-three. We saw new players, freshmen, getting an increased role, and, and that's going to lead to that slow start. So Zane. You know what? What impressed you about the the backup players, the role players, the freshmen that ultimately got into this game? Are you excited for the future that they have, and can, can how much do you think they can contribute to this team moving forward? I think the young talent definitely looked good. I thought they showed a lot of depth because even after Dejon Lane like went out of the game, there was still a lot of other young talent that went in right. there, and I think that's very promising for Penn State fans because obviously you're gonna. Whether KJ Winston leaves after this year, or next year, you also like Zachy Wheatley, who will eventually leave, and Jalen Reed. So yep. find those other guys that are going to replace them. I thought was very good. I think this game was good for Penn State in a lot of ways. It was like a glorified scrimmage for them to find ways to find other players who can fill gaps, who can like grow where they can find their weaknesses. Because sure, Kent State's not a top five team in the nation, but they are still 
a, like they're a team that's not just your practice squad and it allows people to get another look at things. It's not like your own playbook. Yep. It allows for a lot of development and I thought it was really good for them. I thought the defense looked good but as far as like, now the offense wasn't great for Kent State, but the defense looked good for what they had to do. They still had a shutout, which is still impressive. Yep. And so I thought it was good for Penn State to see that. Dom DeLuca went down early. And we'll, yeah, we'll, Cam, Cam Wallace went down late. Yeah, so look pretty yeah, a couple banged up injuries there, but I thought overall the Penn State team looked solid today. I think this was good, build some confidence after a rough game against Bowling Green. I think this will hopefully help boost yep. them into an Illinois team that I think will be a lot more difficult in this game. Yeah, Illinois is certainly a competent team, well-coached, veteran. I think Luke Altmaier and that passing game are actually very underrated now those since okay we don't know the status of Dom DeLuca we don't know the status of Cam Wallace there's already question marks at the depth of safety of linebacker I I, I want to talk about the true freshman that got in the game Dylan who impressed you the most for me I mean Luke Reynolds has the amazing catch and we're not even yeah. getting to the main starters Drew Aller has 300 yards Tyler Warren is the most complete truly tight end in all of college football he's the best tight end in college football but to talk about the role guys that are going to have to step up in a big way so that Illinois doesn't get out of hand, and then eventually a USC and Ohio State, etc. You're going to have to rely on them a lot. I'll cut to the chase. Max Granville impressed me a ton. This is a guy that is supposed to be a high school senior. He's 229 pounds, and he's playing defensive end against other Division I offensive linemen when he is 20, 30 pounds uh, lighter than an Abdul Carter and a Denai Nenis Sutton, and he held his own. Anthony Specka looked really good at that linebacker he position. Credible. He was reading plays very well. Dylan, who else am I missing from those from those role backup players? I mean, those are the two big ones. Uh, you know, I, I thought Quentin Martin looked solid. The numbers he might, he might Quentin Martin might have to play. Yeah, yeah. He might be he, that third running back. Yeah, it may, he may not be one that we you know that makes an impact uh, next week against Illinois or maybe even the next week against UCLA. But as this season progresses. Katron and Nick are going to have to have, uh, you know, some spells out of the game, or they may get Absolutely. a little banged. They're, they're, everybody is going to get banged up at some point, whether it's, it's you know, minor or not, uh, or major injury. Everybody's going to get banged up. He's going to be looked upon, and, and like I said, that Cam Wallace injury did not look good. He, he couldn't put any uh, yeah. weight on yep. that ankle. Um, he had to be carted off the front the sideline into the locker room. Did not look good for. Uh, him. So Quinn Martin's going to be, you know, asked to do a lot. We saw it. Tizier Denmark flash a little bit, went on the field. Yeah, was good routes. Times. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't hear, we didn't see much of, we saw him on the field today. We didn't hear much of him, which is a good thing. Um, you know, Dejon De Lane is, is going to be asked to have a huge role yes. going forward. He played quite a bit today. He was on the field from the second series. Uh, they're going to ask him to they're going to ask him to be on the field quite a bit going forward, obviously, with their three safeties uh, look, using their three safety looks quite a bit. So that's impressive. It's really going to be one of those games I'm going to have to go back and watch a little closer uh, and, and watch closely at the freshman. Uh, but overall, I thought, all, you know, I, I, it was a big day for the young guys. Which is, it's good. And like James Franklin said, post the press conference, you have to credit the older guys for coming in get the job done uh, early on so those younger guys can get uh, plenty of reps. I mean, from the third drive of uh, the third quarter on, it was all backups for the offense. Yep. Uh, and defensively, I mean, Max Kramer was on there in there on the third drive of the game. Yeah. So that, that tells you how much they think highly of him. I don't think he's going to burn his red shirt, uh, but we'll see. Uh, a guy like Quentin Martin uh, now is very much yeah. in danger of burning that red shirt if that can't fall yeah, and let's obviously hope for the best when it comes to what we speculate about the injury. But it, I, I test it does not look good. Okay, quickly to re, to cap off this recap of Penn State versus Kent State, saying something that you think this team needs to clean up. Uh, James Franklin had to address the penalties, seven penalties again, against a team that they dominated. It's undisciplined play. I think that's definitely something you because Big Ten teams will capitalize on those mistakes, those careless plays. Um, to, I, to add 22 penalties for 200 yards for three games. Yeah, that's that's very under uh, uncharacteristic of these James Franklin teams. They do play relatively disciplined for the most part, but that is one thing. I still wasn't overly impressed by the offensive line. I thought they had their issues from time to time. Drew Aller 
had to extend plays. He had to move outside of the pocket uh, against a Kent State team. The average weight of the offensive line of an offensive lineman for Penn State was 324, and uh, Kent State's was in the 260s. So when I see Kent State defensive lineman pushing back into the Penn State offensive lineman, uh, that concerns me quite a bit. So I'm keeping an eye on the offensive line going into better, stiffer competition. Zane, what's the one thing that you think Penn State needs to figure out before Illinois primetime in the stadium? Obviously, I agree with your penalties. I also think the lack of tackling. I thought there was way too many missed Good tackles point. on defense. Good point. That Penn State should have had them probably stop for like three yards, and they ended up getting another five to seven. So I think that's something Penn State definitely needs to clean up, and I'm sure they're well aware of it and are going to be talking about it this week at practice. All right, Dylan? Oh, we talked about the tackling. We talked about the penalties. We talked about the offensive line. I mean, there's there's not really mu much more uh, outside of those three. Um, yeah, I, I think it, for me it goes back to the offensive line. It, I mean, it, most guys have been solved this year, but I, I'm not sure there's a great offensive lineman right now on that offensive line. There's not a superstar um, now. Drew Shelton has had ups and downs. Vega Ione is good, but he's also I'd so, say he's been the best. He's been to the this best, point. but he's also so big that sometimes it's hard for him to keep up with the quicker defensive lineman. Uh, Nick Dawkins is solid. Sal Warmley is good, but not great. Andy Adaka has a chance to be great down the road, but so early in the belt. So they really don't have that one guy yet on the offensive line. Uh, I think they're going to, they don't need that one guy going forward, but they need the offensive line to definitely tighten things up here going into Big Ten play. I think, as is, is a team that's built to beat Illinois next week, uh, which that's going to be a much tougher game than expected. Um, and I'd say just, you know, going back to the first question of what to take away from this game, I don't know if we take away much of from this game as we do take away from. Uh, around the Big Ten, around the country this week. I mean, Illinois looked good against them. I think why will be a solid Nebraska team this year. Uh, yes. USC could not handle the physicality of a Michigan team. But it was that, close. It was close, but a Michigan team that could not throw the ball. Yeah, 32, 32 yards. Penn State's going to be able to throw the ball. Uh, Penn State can also run the ball pretty damn good, too. Nicholas Singleton's average. And a defense to compliment. Yeah, Nicholas Singleton's averaging 8.4 yards per game this season. 8.4 yards per carry this season. So I think we learned more about the teams around the Big Ten this week the point. than necessarily Penn State. And, you know, I while I may feel a little bit, uh, not worse, but while I think Illinois is going to be a tougher one than I originally thought coming this season, I'm also looking at that uh, USC game, that which, you know, coming into this weekend, we're chalking up as maybe a loss now because of the K.J. Winston, Winston injury. Uh, I'm now looking, taking a step back, going, well, maybe that's not a loss if, if, if they cannot handle the physicality of Big Ten football because Penn State, uh, maybe not as physical as Michigan, uh, especially up front, but is still pretty physical team. He's Dylan Callaghan Crowley of Penn State Rivals, HappyValleyInsider.com. Zane Bransfield, associate producer to the Locked On Nittany Lions podcast. I'm your host, Zach Seiko. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments section. Please leave a like on this, share it with friends and family. And if you're not already, become an everyday or subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lions on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts for the latest conversations around your favorite Penn State sports teams. Thanks for checking out this recap of Penn State versus Kent State. 56 to nothing, the Nittany Lions win and improve to 3-0 on the young season.